DiscerningHearts.com presents St. Joseph and His World with Mike Aquilina. Mike Aquilina is a popular author working in the area of church history, specializing in patristics, the study of the early church fathers. He is the executive vice president and trustee of the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology, a Roman Catholic research center based in Steubenville, Ohio. He is a contributing editor of Angelus Magazine and a general editor of the Reclaiming Catholic History series from Ave Maria Press. He is the author or editor of more than 50 books, including St. Joseph and His World, the book on which this series is based. He has hosted 11 television series on the Eternal Word Television Network and is a frequent guest commentator on Catholic Radio. St. Joseph and His World with Mike Aquilina. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Welcome back, Mike. Hey, thanks for having me back, Chris. I've been enjoying the conversation. I say it all the time. I love this book, St. Joseph and His World. I am getting a sense of uh, the man I thought I knew, but I didn't really know. And to know someone isn't just to know about them, but it's to know, this is going to sound strange, but the why of the person, why he was chosen in such an extraordinary way. And in this particular chapter, the sanctification of the everyday, especially when it comes to work, that he would be the the patron for the worker. You help us to really appreciate that. Thank you, Mike. Well, thank you for saying so, uh, Chris, and for noticing, you know, what I had to say about St. Joseph and work. The Jewish attitude toward work in general was different from what we find in other cultures of that time. You know, I tried to bring that up and, and I tried to spell that out with evidence. You know, we, we have all of the great thinkers of Greco-Roman antiquity trying to limit the participation, the active participation of laborers in civic life to try to limit their citizenship. And even the, the super greats like Aristotle, the people we, we extol for their reason, you know, say things like nature would like to distinguish between the bodies of free men and slaves, making the one strong for servile labor, the other upright, and although useless for such services, useful for political life and the arts both of war and peace. And so, you know, we have these hard distinctions. You know, Aristotle also said that no man can practice virtue who is living the life of a mechanic or laborer. Mm -hmm. And to us, this seems crazy because we've had these democratic ideals kind of bred into us. And I think that we've seen uh, through the Christian revolution that virtue exists at all social strata. And you can be a very virtuous man and working with your hands, and you can be a cad and living in tremendous wealth in the aristocracy. So Joseph exemplifies something about Judaism and its respect for the dignity of work, but also something about Christianity and how it introduced that idea to the world. And it was a revolutionary idea. When we think about it, most people have to labor, and it doesn't necessarily mean that the labor has to be something that is thought of as toil as much as what you do with what you're given and whether it's sowing or it's having to till the soil or to garden to to help grow crops there's something that takes a particular knowledge and a wisdom to make things happen properly I, it doesn't matter if you're a, a cashier at a grocery store or a teller at a bank there's task that's been given there's a certain way you can enter into it that can bring about a type of glory. Does that sound too strange? No, I? no, no. I think that is the Christian way. And it's certainly been emphasized in modern times by saints as varied as St. Therese of Lisieux and St. Jose Maria Escriva, you know, that there is a value in the tasks we do. These things that look little in the eyes of the world can really be outsized, can be gigantic in the working out of creation and of history. This is the way God works, not only at the macro level, but at the micro level and even the microbial level. God accomplishes great things through people who are little in the eyes of the world. I thought it was really fascinating in the book. You gave me a paradigm I've never appreciated before in that Adam's fall, 
many people feel that, you know, he was sent out and he had to work and that it was an arduous thing. And yet it actually is a good thing. It's a way of entering into creation. I think, wasn't it Chesterton? That's what convinced him. He was an art historian. So he would look at works of art and realize, oh, look at what these people have created. And then they were created. They must have been created by a creator. So he must exist. Am I taking that too far afield? No, no, no. I would say you're not taking it far enough. I went so far as to say that people are mistaken when they say that work was punishment for the fall. Work was good from the beginning. And as a matter of fact, God is portrayed as working in the act of creation, that he labors for six days and rests on the seventh. Well, we know that that's anthropomorphic language, that God doesn't have arms like we do and and legs like we do, that he wasn't lifting bales and toting barges. He was being God. He was being God in the act of creation, and his work was working with things, and it was good. Every day we hear that what he did was good and what he made was good. Now, when he gets to his special creation, when he gets to Adam, he creates him and tells him to subdue the earth, to work it, you know, to till it, and to guard it, protect it. So he's telling Adam to work and work with his hands. So Adam was a worker from the beginning, and he was created in order to work. Now, Old Testament scholars and the ancient rabbis point out that the language used for those commands is also the language used by God when he was setting up the establishment of Israel's priesthood, that he uses priestly terms to describe Adam's work. So in a sense, Adam is being created as a worker, and he's also being ordained as a priest. He is the first to stand between creation and the creator and act as a mediator and to occupy this sacrificial office. Well, what was supposed to be the stuff of Adam's sacrifice before the fall? Well, the stuff of Adam's sacrifice was all of creation, all the earth. He was the one who had, uh, who had um, kind of a mastery of it, and he was supposed to offer it back to God. This was his priesthood. Now, unfortunately, Adam did not live up to his calling. He was defrocked, so to speak, and he was reduced from his priesthood. But that's what he was created for. He was created to labor and, and then to offer God creation uh, as, as, as a sacrifice. That's what we see from the beginning. When Adam falls, we find that there are consequences for his work. You know, there are thorns and thistles and brambles he has to deal with. There are all kinds of hardships that he has to endure when he goes to work. That's the difference. His work has become arduous after the fall because even the earth is resisting him after that. That's what sin does to us. It makes everything hard. It makes our relationships hard. It makes our work difficult difficult and laborious. It introduces this note of negativity into labor. That's the difference after the fall. I don't like that sin. It's not a good thing. (laughs) All sin is terrible in terms of its effects. You know, we think that we can commit a sin and suffer no consequences, that there are these victimless crimes, but there aren't. All the sins we do, all the sins we commit reduce us and they, they get us out of sync with creation and with our creator. And they make everything hard. They make our work hard. They make our relationships hard. They make life hard for us. The problem is that we habituate ourselves to sin, and we can't imagine ourselves doing otherwise. We would make life easier. We would make our work easier if we would cultivate virtue and really, really cultivate that firm purpose of amendment that we're supposed to have when we go to confession and and try to eradicate sin from our lives, to pull it up by the roots. Well, thank goodness for the new Adam. Thank goodness for Jesus. Yes, that's right, because he has restored us in our common priesthood. He has restored to Adam the priesthood he was supposed to exercise. And so we can offer our work for others. We can offer it for special intentions. We can make our work a priestly act. I work at a desk all day. I work on my laptop all day. These are my altars. 
It's there in the language of the Second Vatican Council that we should offer all the work we do, all our labor, all our leisure, put it on the altar with the gifts that are placed there during the offertory at Mass. And together with those gifts, they'll be offered to Almighty God. Together with the body of Christ, they'll be offered to Almighty God, and they will be pleasing in His sight. So that's what we want to do. We want to do honest work and offer it to God. We make a morning offering. That's a traditional thing for Catholics to do. It was a traditional thing for Jews to do, and that's a sacrificial act. We are making a sacrifice, an offering, for the sake of the salvation of the world when we do our work, as long as we make that offering. So yes, that's a very important prayer in our day, because it makes all the rest of the day a holy sacrifice. You know, after Adam's fall, we find all the patriarchs trying to restore that order of proper sacrifice. The the story of Cain and Abel, immediately after the story of Adam and Eve, their whole argument, their whole encounter was about sacrifice. That's what they were struggling over, the goodness of Abel's sacrifice and the rejection of Cain's sacrifice. You know, throughout history, we see the struggle uh, to align a right interior disposition with the proper form of outward sacrifice. And this happens in fits and starts, but it happens in its fullness in Jesus Christ. When he offers himself, his body and blood on the cross, when he offers himself his body and blood in the Eucharist, you know, the night before he suffers. So we find that in fulfillment and we're given a chance to participate in it. St. Paul says we'll make up what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. We'll make it up in our own flesh for the sake of his body, the church. So this is what we can do through our work. We can make it a priestly sacrifice. We can make all of creation a priestly sacrifice, just as Adam was supposed to do. This is the dignity of ordinary work. This is the dignity of manual labor, of the work of people like seamstresses and carpenters and all of those who work with their hands. I get excited about this, but it's something that's very distinctive about biblical religion. It's something very distinctive about Judaism and Christianity. It's Amazing to me that those that we hold up as the smart guys, the, you know, the Greek philosophers, and they are indeed in very many ways. But as you pointed out with Aristotle, how there's supposed to be this division, that there's those who think and who are in the political arena and seem to know better. And yet, and then there's a very much a division in almost the, those who would work are essentially servants ultimately, to the thinkers, that they exist for no other reason but to fuel what they are going to, in essence, manipulate. Yeah, and and, and I don't want to seem to be picking on the Greeks because this attitude was universal, and it really does set the Jews apart from all other peoples on earth. The Greek historian Herodotus observed that this attitude toward labors was everywhere in the world. Listen to this. He says, now whether this too, the Greeks have learned from the Egyptians, I cannot confidently judge. I know that in Thrace and Scythia and Persia and Lydia and nearly all foreign countries, those who learn trades are held in less esteem than the rest of the people. And those who have least to do with artisans' work are highly honored. So he's making this observation. And it's it's significant, I think, that he says nearly all foreign countries. And I suspect that when he was writing this down, what made him qualify his statement was his knowledge that this is not true among the Jews. Hmm. And that the Messiah would not be placed into a theological think tank, but would be born into a family who its head is a craftsman. You know, that's true. We tend to lionize intellectuals and pundits. I always like to point out that St. Joseph had no part in that life. He was not a philosopher like Philo, and he was not a priest like Zechariah. He was a laborer, and we do not have a single one of his words on record. So what we have from Joseph is what he did, his actions, his deeds. Those are what are memorialized when the story of his life is told in its most reliable form in the Gospel according to Matthew. We'll return to St. Joseph and his world with Mike Aquilina in just a moment.
Did you know that Discerning Hearts has a free app in which you can find all your favorite Discerning Hearts programming? Father Timothy Gallagher, Dr. Anthony Lillis, Deacon James Keating, Mike Aquilina, Dr. Matthew Bunsen, and so many more are found on the Discerning Hearts free app. Did you also know that you can stream Discerning Hearts programming on numerous streaming platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Pandora, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, and so many more. And did you know that Discerning Hearts also has the YouTube page? Be sure to check out all these different places where you can find Discerning Hearts. From a letter from St. Paul to the Ephesians, chapter 6. Be strengthened in the Lord in the might of his power. Put on the armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our wrestling is not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and the powers, against the world rulers of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness on high. Therefore, take up the armor of God, so that you may be able to resist the evil every day and stand in all things perfect. Stand, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, and having put on the breastplate of justice, and having your feet shod with the readiness of the gospel of peace, in all things taking up the shield of faith, with which you may be able to quench all fiery darts of the most wicked one. And take for yourself the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit that is the Word of God. With all prayer and supplication, pray at all times in the Spirit, and be vigilant in all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. The St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology is a nonprofit research and educational institute that promotes life-transforming scripture study in the Catholic tradition. Founded by Dr. Scott Hahn and with current Vice President Mike Aquilina, the center serves clergy and laity, students and scholars with research and study tools, from books and publications to multimedia and online programming. The St. Paul Center welcomes you to their free online studies. Whether you're studying scripture for the first time, looking to take your studies to a higher level, or whether you're ready for advanced training, you've come to the right place. In addition, for each track of study, they recommend books that will enhance your study in prayer and build your library of essential works in biblical theology and spirituality. The studies are free. Just visit SalvationHistory.com to view a complete library. We now return to St. Joseph and His World. With Mike Aquilina. The thing that has maybe tripped us up in the past, if you had chosen to dive into the life of St. Joseph, like you pointed out in an episode previously, that you would encounter the apocryphal tellings, mm-hmm. which kind of, it, I don't want to take away, you're a better storyteller in this, but some of them kind of negated, even when work wasn't perfect. Why don't you break that open for folks, Mike? Well, there, there are these strange ideas there. You know, I, I, they often try to reduce Joseph in order to exalt Jesus and Mary. That the only way we could see them for their glory is at the expense of St. Joseph. And yet that is not something that the, the canonical Gospels do. That's not something that we find in the Gospel of Matthew or St. Luke. That Joseph is presented with dignity in those places, and he's respected She's treated with esteem. So yes, you know, these extra canonical gospels, these folk tales really show Joseph as a a shoddy worker. And Jesus was constantly in the workshop trying to fix Joseph's work by supernatural means. So that when Joseph would saw a board too short, Jesus would stretch the board uh, in order to fit the job. So there were all kinds of things like that. They're they're really distasteful, really unfair, and based on nothing in history. So yes, I have an allergy to those, and the Church Fathers also had an allergy to them. Jerome especially spoke out against such texts, and unfortunately they proliferated anyway, as popular novels will tend to do. 
And already in the time of the church fathers, we have popes like St. Gelasius issuing condemnations of these texts. I think that's why a, a focus on St. Joseph, particularly in a, dedicating a year to St. Joseph, as the church has done, to really try to find that eye, to, to go back, as you said, looking through scripture and history to see who the real man was and not to try to fashion him to be somebody of another particular era. I mean, allow him to be who he is in his place. I think you're right. I, I think that Pope Francis has done us a favor that maybe for the first time in history, we can have kind of a, a purification of our memory, a refinement of the historical record so that we look back on these things and we examine them in study and in prayer. And I'm sure that there will be many conferences in honor of St. Joseph, many events. I've already been somewhat inundated by requests for speaking events mm-hmm. <laughs> in a yeah. year when our, when our travel is, uh, is somewhat limited. So I think that there is going to be greater focus on St. Joseph. And as a result, perhaps we'll think more clearly about him, we'll speak more clearly about him, and we'll see him more clearly as an exemplar, someone we can follow and someone we should follow in our ordinary work. It is very compelling that Jesus would learn his craft from his earthly father. I mean, his, it's always difficult because St. Joseph, in a very real way, is his father on earth. And, and to say he's foster father, adopted father, earthly father, it, those kind of titles, I think it's, people kind of struggle with that. It's good to have uh, someone who teaches you a trade and prepares you for a trade. You know, I I mentioned the last time we got together that the rabbi said, those who don't teach their son a trade, teach him to steal. You know, Mm -hmm. and there's another saying in the rabbinic literature, uh, seven years came the famine, but it did not arrive at the carpenter's door. (laughs) So there's this, this idea that the carpenter is someone who's going to be able to take care of his family even in very difficult times, because he'll always be needed. He'll always be providing a necessary task because things will break down, things will need to be repaired, and he'll be able to make a living. He'll be able at least to get by. And so St. Joseph had that skill, which was transferable. You know, he could go from the Holy Land to Egypt, and he could apply his trade wherever he went. And then he could go back and start the business all over again in the Holy Land. And there was always going to be demand for what he did. And he taught that to his son as well. We don't really get pictures of Jesus applying his trade as carpenter. We only have pictures of him in the Gospels after he took up the practice of teacher. He emerged as a rabbi, but we can imagine that he practiced it with excellence because that's how he practiced his trade as a rabbi. He always did it with excellence. He chose the right metaphors. He did things the right way. He was concerned about the conditions of his speaking, you know, so when the crowd was pressing in on him, he didn't just stop. He stepped out onto a boat so he could get the proper distance to project his voice and continue the work that he knew he had to do. He did everything with a professional excellence. And I think that we could project that backward into his life as a carpenter. He's not someone who became a teacher because he was a failed carpenter. He's someone who was a successful carpenter who achieved the same kind of success as a teacher. It's so interesting what you just said, that the carpenter creates pieces, but he also repairs. And isn't that what Jesus did? (laughs) Yes. He created and he repaired. Yes. So much of of his divine identity, his divine personhood, his divine nature comes through in his human acts. We can see him as creator. We can see him as redeemer, the one who restores. We can see him as teacher, the one who reveals. All of these things come through in his human acts. And I'm sure that they were uh, almost sacramentalized in the work that he did, that the carpentry he performed was a sign of his divinity in many ways. In earlier episodes, we were kind of bringing up the figure of Herod the Great as somebody we could take a look at, you know, here's what's happening with him, but then here's what's happening with Joseph. And now Herod is pretty much gone, but his sons are now involved with the, the leadership, as it were, of the area, aren't they? 
Uh, yes, but you you know something? Herod is never quite gone in the story of St. Joseph because mm. so many of his building programs were projects that required years of construction. Okay, today, you know, they weren't working with the kind of materials that we produce today that could be mass produced mechanically, and construction didn't happen mechanically. It was a laborious, labor intensive process, and it often took years. The rebuilding of the temple was not complete until the last years of Jesus' life. So all during Jesus' childhood, certainly to the end of St. Joseph's life, the projects of Herod, Herod the Great, were still going forward. They were still being completed, and especially his great project of the temple, that was being done with the utmost care and the utmost perfection by the greatest craftsmen in the land. So all of these things were still going forward in the times of his sons, his heirs. We don't know for sure, but we do know that Jesus, of course, assisted St. Joseph in the craft of the family, of being a carpenter. How long do you think he actually performed the family business, as it were? You know, I would imagine that he really did work the family business until the launch of his teaching life. I think that he must have done that in the years, the intervening years, between Joseph's death and his public ministry, because he had to support his mother. He had to take care of her, and he would have done it in the traditional way. That's how he did so much that's in his life. Even when he became a rabbi, it was an office that had a certain tradition that he followed. He did it perfectly. He did it more perfectly than the others and even his predecessors in that tradition, but he did it according to the models that were established, the categories that had been established by his ancestors. So yes, I think we can say that he worked with his hands all through his adolescence and into his adulthood until the time when he launched his life as a teacher and a worker of miracles. There must have been a great joy when, and I don't mean to to be so fanciful in my imagining here, but there must have been a great joy for St. Joseph to see the first thing that Jesus would create. Yes, and I would imagine that that happened at a, a very early age, because as I said, it seems from the historical record that these artisans that grew up in the family business, they were always around the workshop, and they were made to take part in the work from very early in life. So they were given something to do. They were told to sweep the floor. They were told to carry something. You could say, why don't you take this hammer over to your dad? He needs it right now. And so Jesus would, you know, little Jesus would walk the hammer across the workshop floor and give it to his dad. And that would be his important task for the day. This is the way you grow up in a business. Uh, You know, it's funny. I've worked from home since my children were very small. And all of my kids grew up thinking that what adults do is read and write. So, so many of my children have kind of grown into professions that require these things. And you can see how it happened. What they saw their parents doing day in and day out was reading and writing. That's what you imitate and you're given chances to cooperate with. And you want to try your hand at it from very early. You know, I write books. That's what I do for a living. And, and my son grew up watching me do that. And so when he wanted to earn some money to buy amateur radio equipment when he was an adolescent, he asked me, well, what do you do when you need more money, Dad? And I said, when I need more money, I write another book. And so he said, I- I'll write a book. And he wrote a book. And he got it published. He wrote his book on St. Jude, and he got it published. I think he was 14 years old when it appeared in print. So yeah, I mean, this is what kids will do when there's a family business, when there's a home business, when they're growing up in the trade. Yeah, you remind me of my brother. He's a hardworking blue collar guy in Michigan. And yet he had such a good work ethic, the value of work and doing (laughs) it well and treating your coworkers well. And I know my nephew learned so much from my brother. Now, he ended up going into a different type of trade than my brother. And even though it was a different type, I can see in my nephew the same ethic, the same appreciation for the people you work with, with doing a good job and doing it well. That is important. And I get a sense that's exactly what your kids and hopefully our kids, too, will take on. 
Uh, you know, I, it's something I wish I had had when I was a kid, and I didn't. You know, my father was a welder. He worked for a coal mining company, and he worked on heavy equipment. But in those days, there was no take your child to work day. That didn't happen. <laughs> you know, so I never, I actually never saw my father's workplace. I passed by it on the road, but I never saw the inside of the breaker. I never saw the inside of the, of the sheds where they repaired the equipment just wasn't part of my childhood. I, and now I, I wish I had seen that. I wish I had seen him work. And, and frankly, I wish I had, I had the level of motor skills that he had in the, the trades that he practiced. So there's so much that we miss out on if our children don't see us work. I really think it's wonderful that nowadays you can take your child to work on at least one day a year and they can, can see how life is lived out by adults. Too much today, I think, is just sealed out off from children and they don't really have an idea of what happens day to day, hour to hour and how it's done. Mm -hmm. I think you're absolutely right. And again, having the model of St. Joseph, especially as the way you portray him, or should I say, the way you offer him to us, it's not so much about what he does, which is important, and you clarify that, but it's how he does it. Yes, yes, because I, I mean, all of those people I quoted earlier, Aristotle and Herodotus, they still would not have been impressed by his life at the end of it. You know, they would have seen it as an insignificant life, a life that did not have a hint of nobility. And they would have been wrong. And I'm confident in saying that because of the effect that he had on history. I think that his was a life of great significance. It was a life of great dignity. And it was a life of great nobility. The true aristocracy is an aristocracy of virtue. And he was a prince in terms of virtue. And he's a model for all the generations that followed down to our own. We can go on a, a very long list, I'm sure, of the importance of the father passing on that how, how you do it, how you live it. Mm -hmm. and, and we can see that in the lives of saints. I'm thinking of St. John Paul and his father, or so many others down the road who were influenced as saints because of how their fathers lived out their lives in that model of virtue. And boy, we need that because as you said, I mean, even today, the image of fatherhood, just like those apocryphal writings of, that Jesus had to come out and rescue poor St. Joseph because he didn't get something right. And we do that in like t television sitcoms and things like that. We sacrifice the character of a strong father. Yes, all the things that were characteristics of St. Joseph were mocked in those times. You know, that the fact that he grew up in the hinterlands, that he was rural, that he, he was in flyover country, so to speak, in the middle of nowhere, the fact that he worked with his hands, the fact that he was lower middle class, if you want to put it that way, all of these things that were mocked in that time, you know, we should see just as beautiful, really, that God works in this way, and he really does drive history using instruments, using the means, using, you know, guiding the people, really, we would least expect. We should always be attentive to others, and we should try to trim our prejudices and really ask ourselves about our expectations of people, you know, what kind of um, sweeping generalizations do we make about people who live in places like Nazareth or who occupy certain trades that are necessary, but which we find without distinction? No, th these may be the people who are driving history in our own time. And when we neglect them, we're neglecting the likes of the Holy Family. St. Joseph, he didn't stop working. Just go ask St. Teresa of Avila or St. Andre Bissette. <laughs> that's right that's He's right he, today isn't he he is he is and he and 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 emerging more into the light from the shadows as the centuries go on there's been such an increase in devotion to saint joseph over the last half millennium really and it's been driven by saints like the ones you mentioned he's a great man he's emerging more into the light and he seems to be taking more and more an active role in the piety of the church. And I think that's wonderful. Well, Mike, thank you so much. And I can't wait for our next conversation about the great St. Joseph. <laughs> yes, I'm looking forward to it. You've been listening to St. Joseph and His World with Mike Aquilina. 
To learn more about this subject, you can purchase the book, St. Joseph and His World, on which this series is based. Visit scepterpublishers.org, the website for the publisher, Scepter Publishers. Or you can find it at any fine Catholic bookstore. To hear and or to download this episode, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com. Or you can find it in the Discerning Hearts free app. This has been a production of the Discerning Hearts in cooperation with the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will please pray for our mission. And if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax-deductible, to help support our effort. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about discerninghearts.com. And join us next time for St. Joseph and His World with Mike Aquilina.